Um, Captain Taylor, you commanded a Type 7 U boat, is that correct? That's correct. Yeah, type 7. Could you tell us something about the Type 7? What did you like about it? Was there anything you didn't like about that boat? This sensational series contains interviews with individuals, predominantly U boat captains, who are in positions of responsibility during World War II and directly influenced the events that took place. These high-ranking individuals are asked relevant and probing questions and then allowed to freely describe their experiences in their own words. In this sense, it's similar in flavor to the iconic 1974 documentary series, The World at War. To get off to a good start, Episode 1 covers an interview with Gerhard Teta, who served as the captain on U-466 and U-3506 during the war. He led five combat patrols for a total of 182 days at sea, and was decorated with the Iron Cross Second Class, the Iron Cross First Class, and the U-Boat War Badge. During the interview, we'll show the 1942 German film U-Boote am Feind, which documents the life of a U-boat crew during a combat patrol in the Atlantic. During the last part of the interview, I've added some nice footage documenting a late 1943 U-boat attack in the Indian Ocean. So stick around, it's worth it. This production has been made in cooperation with the organization Shark Hunters, which is certainly the predominant authority on all aspects of the U-Boat War. A link to their website can be found pinned in the comment section below. But now, let's get back to Gerd and let him tell his own story. The boat was a tradition. That was our typical Atlantic boat, what more or less all the well-known German skippers had during the war. They started out normally with Type 2, and then they went over to this Type 7 boat. Yeah, what what means, what shall I tell you about the the boat at all about the type. It was a very successful boat, as you know, but uh, it was not a U-boat in the uh, main uh, consideration, because it was just the boat was, was diving to, uh, able to dive. It could not stay underwater for a very, very long time, which, which meant it was, was, was not a U-boat like later on the Type 1 was. That was really a U-boat. Uh, as you know, this, this uh, Type 7 boat was in the beginning of the war, 40, 41, 42, very, very successful in the Atlantic. And then later on, you know what happened since 43. Well, maybe you should talk about that a little bit. You, you took your Type 7 into the Atlantic in the winter of 1943. That's correct, in, in January of 43. Mm. Uh, that was the very height of the Battle of the Atlantic. Um, uh, was yeah, the worst, it started out in May 43. That was the worst month with, at that time, I think, uh, loss, losses of more than 40 boats. So it was uh, very difficult to operate. What was the most um, important of the Allied weapons that you feared? Uh, in my feeling, certainly the radar. But uh, even all other counter weapons have been made proper uh, progress during the years of the war. But uh, uh, in my opinion, because I, I always had trouble with, with planes, uh, which just recognized us by a radar. And so in my opinion, radar was the most problem for us at that time. Well, to, uh, to change the subject just a little bit, uh, you passed twice through Gibraltar. Once as a skipper and once as a watch officer. The first time when I went through Gibraltar was in December '41. At that time, I was first first watchkeeping officer on U568. The skipper was uh, Captain Lieutenant Preuss, and <coughs> that was a big difference to the second time because when we went through with uh, 568, we went surfaced with 12 knots and uh, passed the British destroyer on approximately 100 to 200 meters, but she didn't even see us. And 
when I went through the second time with three, five, uh, with uh, four, six, six, a uh, skipper, um, there I dived already west of Gibraltar and all the way down uh, to Malaga. I came up again and I have been underwater for 90, uh, 39 hours, which was quite a lot. And the CO2 CO was quite, quite a lot in the boat at that time. And uh, even I was attacked by, I don't know what, but uh, anyway, uh, a bomb somewhere. Uh, we thought it was a bomb which was towed between two uh, uh, patrol boats. And there I ran out uh, on that bomb right away and uh, uh, more or less the whole bow was, was gone out and I was, when we went into it too long, I was standing on the torpedo tubes the front. Uh, I, I, everything before the tubes was gone, ab absolutely completely gone. Entire deck casing in. Entirely gone, gone yeah. <clears throat> That's incredible. So that was the difference between the two types. <laughs> Sank the destroyer. Huh. Could you tell us about that action? It must have been a difficult target. Uh, that that was in November, the 9th of November, forty-three. And uh, my first watchkeeper over that time was Captain, now Captain uh, Hess, which you meet later on. And uh, he was on on watch, and uh, he got me up out of, out of the bed. And I went up and I saw that destroyer in approximately thousand meters away, and then I figured his speed out, and I was uh, shooting an acoustic torpedo, and, and uh, that was running it very well, and so we hit that destroyer and he sank, and he sank on my boat, partly at least. So as as the destroyer was sinking, you were beneath it. I was just on, underneath it, yeah. So it just I was I was on sixty meters when, when he was hit by my torpedo and then he sank and on forty meters I sank all his water bombs went up and uh, there I got right right something from up. So all torpedo tubes broken and, and, and both both periscopes broken and, and all these nice things which happened in the uh, thing. <clears throat> so the, the the torpedoes that exploded No they not they, they didn't explode. The, uh, no no just what? just the just the tubes broke by the detonation of the water bombs. Sinking um, destroyer. Yeah. yeah. And mm -hmm. okay. Well, <laughs> the, um, the North Atlantic in 1943 was a very difficult place to operate, and I know that uh, you had some difficulty. All skippers had great difficulty in penetrating the escort screens of convoys. Mm -hmm. Was this because of increased skill of the Allies or increased numbers? Or... Uh, I would say both. They increased skill and they certainly increased the numbers. And uh, it doesn't matter where you have been, if in the North or Middle or South Atlantic, all over you had uh, uh, lanes. I went down to the Brazilian coast because I wanted to to uh, enter one of these harbors there. And there I was catched by one plane and always when I came up again, I had another plane. And I shot down there one Liberator and uh, one uh, Cabellina just on the coast of, of uh, Brazil. All over you had ceased what we said. God, God came. Planes around. <clears throat> okay, well, let's let's uh, switch topics again just a little bit, and rather than talking about the um, operations on the ocean, I'd like to explore a little bit of some of the personalities. First of all, uh, could you tell me a little bit about Wilterns? I know that that was he still needing the boats at the dockside when you first began Kinnisky? Admiral Dern, it's always took the time to meet every skipper who came back from a war patrol. And so I, I made a skipper five patrols, so I met him five, five times. And um, in my opinion, he was the most wonderful admiral we ever had in our Navy. 
And uh, by chance, I, at the end of the war, when he took over the German government, I found it together with uh, Captain Kramer, the guard battalion, because we, we found it a tank destroying battalion before and uh, went out in the defense of Hamburg because our boat, both boats were not ready anymore to, to go somewhere at all because we hadn't uh, some trouble with spare parts. And uh, so we founded this tank battalion and uh, were defending Hamburg for a while. And then when Dönitz took over, Captain uh, Kramer and myself, we drove down to Plön where Dönitz were at that time and told him he has to get a guard battalion now and then he has to take submarine. That's what he did. And then we went to the government with him and to Plön first and then from Plön over Kiel to Pittsburgh. So at that time you were waiting for a command of a Type 21 boat? I, I, I had it. I had it at that time. I, I, uh, com I commissioned this 1021 type, this uh, 3506, on the 14th of October 44. And I had made all, all the normal exercise and training which is necessary before you went to uh, war patrol. And uh, then I went to Hamburg in the shipyards for the last works what have to be done. And there they found out that I needed a new engine for slow, uh, noiseless uh, uh, speed. We had a, 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 on the 21 type special engines for noiseless driving, very slow one and, and, and uh, small engines only and I needed one another one which because my was was uh, worn out and that's that the, the industry couldn't give us anymore so, so we founded that material that was the reason uh, my my boat was as I told you was at Hamburg in the shipyards at the time for repair and uh, I had uh, have been out with Kramer and uh, is 200 men around before Hamburg. And so my boat was in a bunker and on the 2nd of May it was scuttled by order, by my order, but from my personnel, which was over there. I, I personally was not at Hamburg at that time when the boat was blown up. And that was in a bunker, which you can still see, there is one bunker still there, uh, uh, where three boats are scuttled, laying in that bunker right now. So, Mm. And yours is one of them. Hmm? And yours is one of them. Yeah, yeah. Mine was one of them. The Type 21 really was a big change. As I told you before, the Type 7, Type 9, and so on these boats were no U boats. They were dive, were boats diving, uh, uh, able to dive. But the Type 21 was really uh, uh, a U boat. Because when you went down, when you were diving, you could stay for weeks underwater with that boat because had, that boat had a snorkel, had tremendous bigger batteries than the other ones. As a, for example, the type, uh, type 21 batteries were three times as big as on the Type 7 boat. And uh, which meant that the speed underwater was much higher on a 21 boat than a Type 7. For example, Type 7, a ty type seven had seven knots as high as speed underwater. And the Type 1 had a nearly, my boat had nearly 16 knots, 15.8 have we driven on the mile. So that was quite a difference. And uh, during the training time, I have attacked the convoy a few times because I was always able with that boat to go in front of the convoy again because my boat was faster than the convoy was going. So there was a real difference. No question about that. <clears throat> Do you think that um there been enough Type 21s at the Battle of the Atlantic might have ended this way? We had uh, uh, ready, more or less ready. Uh, let's put a, put a, let's put a, let's, better let us put this way. We had commissioned 140 boats, approximately. Maybe two, three less, two, three more. And um, uh, on a mission, on a patrol, just has been one boat that was uh, uh, 2511 under Captain Schnee. Uh, he was, went out for a mission, but uh, he didn't attack any ship anymore because the war was over when he, he was close to Norway at that time and on the, on the 5th, 5th of May. So no, no boat has been on a mission. So, 
But uh, as Churchill said to himself, that uh, he would have been very, very angry when these boats had been come to two missions in a bigger, bigger uh, number. Can you tell us how you came to be in the Navy and how you came to be in the submarine corps? Did you always want to be in the Navy? Uh, that is a very, very easy to answer question because my father was an admiral in the Navy, but not at that time. Uh, he, he became admiral in 42 and I joined the Navy already in 36. But I never in my life, even when I have been a little boy, I had another idea than, than to go into the Navy. I, even when, I, when the Navy wouldn't have taken me for health reasons or something like that, I really at that time wouldn't have known what to do. There was just no other idea for me at all than to become a naval officer, even with my brother was the same. And my father's father was in the Navy too, and my, my son was a submarine commander and now in the Bundesmarine. So we, we all were, were naval people. <clears throat> Can you remember your, any of your, your experiences when you were in training in the submarines? Or any moments that you recall? Uh, yeah, a, a nice story, for example. Uh, one day I got the order to take officers from the Air Force and from the, from the Army for, for a trip in the, in the Baltic. And so I decided we, we show them something about the submarine and uh, we made a uh, a load, an echo load. I don't, don't know if you know what, what, what that is. That is a thing where to, you can figure out the depth. You you throw it into the water and then it detonates and uh, you can can uh, find how, how deep you are. And I put three of these little charges on my periscope and I made an alarm dive and I put my periscope up and it was on a, on a, on a the line and they broke and they put the kerspo up on the three little charges came on the tower and it was a big explosion and at the same time all light went out uh, water came through somewhere and uh, i ran with the boat right into the ground and uh, then it's the stick in them out and i could, couldn't get the boat out and uh, then suddenly one of these Air Force officers came to my quartermaster and said, look, how deep do we are here? How deep, how deep is the Baltic here? And, uh, I, and, and I had uh, pressed air onto the, the manometer for the depth and that showed 200 meters, you know. And uh, then he, this uh, Air Force officer went to the quartermaster and looked at the chart, at the map, and he found out that were just 60 meters. And then I looked at him and saw he had the submarine uh, medal from World War I. So he was a submariner originally and went to the Air Force in, in, in 35 or something like that. And then I said, I had it, you know. And uh, it took quite a time to get the boat out again from the ground. But then we made it and I was happy when I could, could get up again. It was a real nice, interesting story. And we all had our fun first, and then later on we, we made long, long uh, phases. Oh, yeah, that's good. You, uh, of course, were a submarine skipper and, and you knew a submarine skipper. This is a very difficult job to do, especially on long missions that you do. What qualities do you think a good submarine skipper should have? Good U-boat skipper. Uh, I I wouldn't say that a submarine skipper should especially more qualification have than any naval officer has to have normally. But what what is in in my opinion the most important thing for a skipper on a submarine is that you have the crew in your hand uh, and you have to be able to show the crew what to do. And uh, uh, a sub is, has just a small crew of, of 42, uh, 52, 53 men on, on type 7, for example. And that must be a friendship, a big, big family, as what I always used to say, 
they all have to stick together. And that that is the main thing. And that that you have to have to, to tell them and you have to, to get them into this idea. And uh, that became a little always more difficult as long as the war where because the personnel was less good anymore as that war than it was the first time. But uh, the first time we were all volunteers uh, uh, who came in the submarine service. I tried to get in the, ser in the service already in, 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 in 39. After the war started, I tried to get in. I was, uh, and, uh, at first, they put me there on patrol boats, on e-boats. And uh, later on, in, in 41, I came, I came uh, uh, submarine service. It took a longer time. Because at first time there were lots of volunteers, but later on it became worse. Now, pretend for a moment that Dennis is another skipper, and it's 1943. He's just been given order to go from France to Lorient and to go from Gibraltar into the Mediterranean, and he knows that you have been through twice and he's asking you how can i do it what do i need to know i would i would tell him the same thing uh, uh, he should do it so uh, uh, like i have it done i went in the spanish uh, uh, area in the i don't know what's in english now who it's uh, uh see you heard about the three miles uh, uh, border and what inside was 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 the uh, spanish uh, uh, territory but i was going in santander already in the spanish territory and drove down all the way under uh, uh, to cardis all the way surrounding uh, spain uh, uh, in the territories of spanish waters and uh, that was the, the best possibility to get off the of the airplanes because we were a little bit under the coast and uh, uh, there was lots of fisher traffic fishing boats and so on so that was the best way to come down to the to the street of uh, Gibraltar unhurted and uh, then to go through there that was just luck or not luck that's all it has nothing to do with a good skipper or a worse skipper or, a, or whatever it is that is luck. And you can make it come to go through there. Can you tell us where you were at when you heard the war was over and how the people around you responded or how you all felt? It had been a long war, a hard war. Where were you when it ended in reaction? Uh, I was when the war ended, as I told you before, in the... Uh, Guard battalion of Grand Admiral Dönitz. And uh, Dönitz was still on job until the 23rd of May, 45. And at that time, the Brits took the whole German government, including Dönitz. And uh, that meant for us that our job was over too. And uh, uh, so they tried to get us in a prisoner of war camp. But uh, I decided after the war was over, it's better for me to go home and not to go in a camp. In a camp. And so I did. I took my, my duty car I still had and went to Hamburg, where I lived at that time. I, I lived with my family in, in the house on, from Captain Kramer. We were living together in one house. And uh, then I went to... There still was a German office under an admiral in Hamburg. And uh, I went to see him and uh, asked him if he has a job for me. And he said, yes, I, I, can, I can need you. And I took over a patrol boat flotilla in Hamburg. Uh, but on order of the Royal Navy, but under a German admiral. And uh, the last, and th that were all former German fishing boats, boats, fisher boats, who had to go back to their, uh, as if they originally came from. And um, uh, the last boat was originally built for the Russian. Fisher, Fisher uh, fleet, and that I had to bring by order of the Brits to the Russians, and they took over that boat in Swinemunde, 
where I went with that, with that boat. And then when I came back, uh, I started to work for, for the uh, Ritz somewhere there, British Navy in Kiel. And uh, then I went to the American Army and uh, I've been a uh, deputy officer in the uh, guard battalion in the army, that were German outfits. And then I decided it's time now to look for a blue uniform again, and I went back to the U.S. Navy, and then I've been in the, in the minesweeping unit in Bremerhaven, and uh, then uh, I took over later on the German side from the U.S. Rhine River Patrol uh, in Karlsruhe. And from there, I went back into our Navy. Now, when, during the time that you were serving in Type 7s, patrols became increasingly difficult. You undoubtedly heard that there were new machines coming, that there was there were better submarines coming. What was your reaction when you first saw the, either saw the plans for it, or you actually first saw the Type 21? What was your reaction? How did you think that that would change things? Uh, we all felt that when we have these boats, that uh, we could probably win the war. But Churchill stated later on too. And uh, the pity was then that according to the strength of the uh, mainly U.S. Air Force, which uh, damaged all our outfits where these, these boats were built, that it's got longer and longer and longer to get boats to a war patrol. And as I told you before, just not one had that done it at all. But we felt, and that is, I think, the question you want to have answered, we felt that with that boats, there was still a chance to win that war. At the time the war began, were you expecting war where it was Germany prepared for the war with the submarine force? Uh, you mean when the war started in 39? No, we were not. Uh, uh, as you know, we had, we started out the war with 57 boats that included, included all type two boats too, which were normally coastal boats and not, not uh, useful for Atlantic or something like that. And uh, then even there was, some we have some problems with one admiral wanted to have big ships Dönitz wanted to have submarines and to to get that in the role it took quite some time and uh, in my opinion it took too long until we got that number of submarines what we really needed then, then uh, the success would, would have been even more and it was so I suggest that you take a look at the website sharkhunters.com. Use the QR code to get to our Patreon page and see our different levels of support to get access to exclusive footage. Open a free account on our website military1945.com. If you like this kind of material, please subscribe to the channel and like the video. Thanks for watching.